So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, ninth panel of the third international conference on Cordillera Studies with the theme Indigenous Peoples and the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the sub-theme of panel nine is Education for Sustainable Development Initiatives from Benguet Schools. We have two very interesting presentations for this session. One by Mom Claire Palasin, and the other is an organized panel with corresponding author, Dr. Maria Mercedes Arzadon. Before I introduce the presenters, and of course the other abstracts that are part of this panel, let me just introduce myself briefly. And of course, give you some reminders for the rules of this session. Um, yeah, my name is Orvin B. Pancho, faculty of the Department of Communication, University of the Philippines, Pavio. And I will be your moderator. With me is Mitzi. Um, she will assist me in moderating this session for a smooth uh, flow of the meeting. To ensure the order in the Zoom session, may request the audience to mute yourselves when it is not your turn to speak. Should you have questions, you may type them in the chat box or yeah, we have the Q&A box for your questions. At any time during the presentations, you may want to type your questions and we will entertain them at the end of all the presentations. Otherwise, later during the Q&A forum, you may raise your hand or ask your question live or verbally if you don't want to type your questions uh, during this meeting. Again, we will entertain all your questions at the end of the session. Okay, um, we have a fairly good number of participants here in the Zoom room, we have 56. And of course, good morning and hello to all the viewers in YouTube and other platforms for which uh, the session is being streamed. Okay, with that being said, let me introduce the first presenter for this session, Claire Balassi. Claire Balassin has been a public school teacher for 14 years. She is presently a grade six teacher at Natobleng Elementary School. And the title of her presentation is Development and Utilization of 10 Kankanae Storybooks for Grade 2 Pupils at Natobleng Tenger. So Mitzi will now share uh, Ms. Claire's presentation. Good morning, everybody. The title of the research talk on the development and utilization of 10 Kankanai storybooks for grade 2 pupils at Natublong Elementary School, Natublong Bugias. The state shall foster the preservation enrichment in dynamic evolution of the Filipino cultural in base on the principle of unity in diversity and a climate of free artistic and intellectual expression. Based on 1987 Constitution, Article 14, Section 14. MTB and MLE is the centerpiece of Quito 12 program of the Department of Education in the Philippines, Republic Act 1053-3. Various studies point out to the fact that child's mother tongue is the best language of learning and developing literacy skills, ensuring comprehension in subject areas like science and social studies. Mother tongue provides an effective bridge to and foundation for the learning of other languages like English, according to DepEd Order 74 series. The purpose of my study is to examine the development and utilization of 10 Kankanai storybooks that were developed to improve the reading skills of the grade 2 pupils of Natublong Elementary School and Nabali Saltin Elementary School in the year 2018-2019. The importance of my study focus on beginning reading, rest on the principle that young pupils should learn how to read so that as they get older, they can read to learn and become lifelong learners. Here are objectives in development of Kankanai storybooks. Number one, conceptualize stories with grade two competencies in the mother tongue subject. Number two, observe DepEd guidelines in making small books for grade two 
and mother tongue. Number three, apply the spelling guide of the kankanai orthography in making small books. And submit small books for quality assurance at Deep Ed Benguet Division. And finally, uploading and sharing through the learning resources and development system. Here are steps in making Kankanai storybooks. Number one, list all the least learned competencies. Number two, identify the sets of stories to be developed to address the least learned competencies. Number three, write a proposal for making and utilization of Kankanai books. Number four, submit the proposal to the division office for the review and approval. Number five, write the story books. Number six, proofread and edit the text of the stories to be done by the other teachers, elders, and other Kankanai speakers in the community. Number seven, illustrate the edited stories. Eight, print the edited illustrated stories. Nine, Submit the completed small box to the DepEd District Quality Assurance Team. And bookbind the compendious stories. The following storybooks titles that were developed. Number one, Ubu, Customary Self-Organizing Cooperative Work. Number two, Din Bunag Marta, Marta Siotin Seals. Number three, Din Karot Milo, Milo the Karot Man. Four, Tawid, Inheritance. Five, Din Buko, Pounded Sweet Kamoti. Six, Din Ganso, the Ghost. Seven, Luglug, Indigenous Shampoo. Eight, Din Tapoy, Rice Wine. Nine, Inayan, This is a Good Values. And Gangan Os, the fruit of one's labor. The storybook sorted to improve the following competencies. Number one, noting details, sequencing of events, predicting of outcomes, retailing of the story, and answering why questions. The pictures of the storybooks. Number one, Din Boko. Pounded Sweet Kamoti is an example of indigenous knowledge, skills, and practices that should preserve. Din Bunag Marta, it talk about values and development. Din Karot Milo, Milo the Karot Man, integrates values with mathematical equation. Din Ganso, the ghost, talk on value and character development among children. Din Tapay, rice wine, are indigenous practices that observe up to this time. Gan Gan Os, the fruit of one's labor, is a story of success amidst hardship. Nayan. Good values or indigenous practice which aims to show, to caution her himself not to do bad action. Din Luglug, indigenous shampoo, example of indigenous knowledge, skills, and practices that should preserve. Tawid, inheritance, the value or the importance of education. Ubo, customary self-organizing co cooperative work that observed during gardening. Using the storybooks and mother tongue class, the teacher used the shared reading strategies that includes discussing and retelling the story. Post-reading activities, interpretative drawing and Dramatization. Here are pictures of pupils using the storybooks. Pupils read individually and per group, then their classmates will ask 
questions. Pupils apply the stories about tapay by actual preparation of tapay and class. Pupils do pair teaching. They read and answer questions with their partners. As a result of the study, the reading mastery assessment revealed that from the pre-test score of 46.93, there were 41 respondents, improved significantly with the post-test score of 86.93. 54%. The study also found that pupils demonstrated remarkable entries in reading as would repeatedly read the books individually or in groups. The storybooks also created awareness and stirred question among pupils about indigenous knowledge. The conclusion made were MTB MLE result to production of Kankanai storybooks. The storybooks develop skills and entries both for reading and cultural heritage. Recommendations made. Number one, pre-test and post-test should always be administered to the learners to identify the mastery level of the learners in different competencies and to access learning. Number two, mother tongue teachers shall take the responsibility to create learning resources such as small book and big books to facilitate and catalyst effective learning. Number three, to maintain mastery level, the use of small books in teaching is highly recommended. Learners should be given opportunities to read and to do some activities. Number four, to attain usefulness in utilization of small books, they should shared with other mother tongue teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Mom Claire, for the presentation that has implications for mother tongue based instruction. Now we have one more presentation for this organized panel and two more abstracts to be read. In fact, I thank Professor Chet Arzadon for making my job a little bit easier. Mom Claire, followed by Professor Arzadon. And number three and four will be abstracts read by Professor Arzadon. Um, that said, let me introduce the second presenter for this session. Maria Mercedes Arzadon. Ma'am Ched or Professor Arzadon is from Tayuk, Pangasinan, but she had her early schooling in Lepanto, Benge. She is presently a faculty member of the College of Education, University of the Philippines. The title of her presentation is The Story About the Disappearance of Kamote and the MPB Emily Big Books of Benge. Let's enjoy this presentation. Mm -hmm. Good day, everyone. My paper is entitled The Story About the Disappearance of Kamote and the MTB MLE Big Books of Benguet. This study is part of my dissertation uh, in the Anthropology and Sociology uh, of Education at, uh, Department at the College of Education, University of the Philippines. Uh, background of the study, since 2009, the Department of Education of the Philippines has introduced several policies to promote the use of local languages and indigenous knowledge in primary school. Uh, the, the, there was the directive uh, that the curriculum uh, should be designed and delivered uh, as contextualized, localized, and indigenized curriculum. And because of this policy, DEPED has been developing teaching learning resources in local languages and Philippine languages. These resources uh, include spelling guide, grammar guides, and reading materials like uh, these storybooks. And so far, uh, 65 languages uh, in the Philippines have been provided with such support. And therefore, they can be used as medium of instruction uh, in elementary school. 
because of these policies, uh, school communities are directed to create their own uh, storybooks or instructional materials in local language uh, with a special priority on beginning reading and children's literature. They should be original, reflecting local people, events, realities, and appropriate to the language, age, and culture of the learners. And recently, uh, DEPED has directed the schools to read uh, at least one to two storybooks uh, in, from kindergarten to grade three. It, uh, it means that a class should have at least uh, 50 plus storybooks to fulfill this directive. However, uh, a study showed that only 45 schools uh, in, in the sample schools uh, conducted by, in a study conducted by Monhe et al. Therefore, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a need to uh, discover, to explore how big book making can be, uh, can happen, can be introduced uh, in a school. Why big books? Uh, big books are usually uh, made by teachers, especially in non-dominant languages. They are enlarged, A3, uh, that a class can read together for shared reading uh, experiences. So they are used for teaching literacy, numeracy, and content areas, including indigenous knowledge. The objectives of the study is first to describe the ways teacher writers enact the policy uh, directives on localized production of contextualized storybook to an, uh, identify the actors involved in the big book making processes to analyze the contextual factors that influence the making of the storybooks. Uh, the study is uh, informed by the theory uh, of policy enactment. Instead of policy implementation, my study utilized the, uh, the notion of policy enactment uh, it is, was introduced by Ball, Braun, and McGuire. Instead of a managerialist, managerialist view of policy implementation, educational ethnographers like Ball uh, and his colleagues view policy from all sides, especially from the bottom or from the school uh, perspective. Policies are enacted by social agents or social actors. They interpret and translate the policy through complex and creative ways. In other words, teachers are not mere recipients of a policy, but they interpret and make policy happen. However, uh, their agency is not uh, complete. Uh, they are, you know, it, uh, it is influenced by several factors, by contextual factors that can either enable or disable uh, the enactment of a policy. Here is how contextualization is formulated by the uh, by the Dep Ed policy or the K to 12 law. So when you say contextualization, it means uh, relating or connecting the school curriculum uh, to the life, to the knowledge system of the community. Uh, it is uh, making the curriculum meaningful and relevant. Uh, it also recognizes what the communities have what the communities have. It is providing appropriate, adequate, and culturally relevant instruction and materials. Uh, from an anthropological perspective, uh, Abaya used uh, Filipino terms to describe contextualization. It can mean pagpapakahulugan, paglalagay sa paligid, paglulunan, pagpupuok, pag-uugnay-ugnay, pagkakabit-kabit, at pagbabalangkas. I, Roughly translated these terms as meaning making, place making, interrelating, connecting, and framing. It involves the use of real world materials and activities and a way of imagining the place through critical thinking, problem solving, and creativity. So this frame is a reaction against the usual compensatory and fragmented view of indigenous education or multicultural education. Sometimes uh, indigenous education is viewed as merely adding the four F, uh, food, festival, folklore, and fashion. So it's uh, just adding. Uh, contextualization in a critical uh, pedagogist perspective is going beyond that. It's that just identifying the differences. It involves a holistic understanding of a certain uh, group or a certain community it involves transformation and social change. 
Uh, the methodology that I use is ethnography. Uh, my research locale is Bugias Benguet uh, in Northern Philippines. Uh, I stayed in Luo for three months in 2018 and I visited schools in six barangay. Uh, my main interlocutors were the big bookmakers. I also interviewed other individuals who were involved in the big bookmaking processes. The major finding of the study is that in the span of seven years, uh, the, the Bugyas district through their teachers have produced 300 storybook titles, mostly in Kankanae and few in Filipino and English. Uh, there were at least 19 writers that I found and six illustrators. Uh, this study found that the policy actors in Bugyas enacted the policy through the following. This is how they interpreted uh, and translated the policy. Uh, they uh, formulate, uh, they created a localized book supply chain that involves storytellers, writers, illustrators, editors, layout artists, and photocopying shop uh, workers. Uh, they also came up with their contextualization practices that give representation of the place, local history, cultural values, and environmental changes. And finally, they created a, a teaching a literacy instruction a system or approach called anidot. Uh, anidot is uh, four uh, sounds, uh, first sounds of the Kankanae primer. Uh, it involves the use of the big books in teaching reading and writing, um, uh, use, the use of the primer, uh, practices in group and individual reading, and uh, reading for pleasure uh, uh, practices. One contextual factor that facilitated the writing of the story is the presence of uh, cultural practices, the storytelling practices in Bugyas. And, uh, it, this happened uh, especially during celebration and uh, cultural gathering like wakes and weddings. Uh, these uh, are the photos that were taken from three wakes that I attended in Barangay Luo. Uh, I have visited other wakes uh, in the Philippines, but uh, I found it uh, quite different, uh, noticeable that in Bugyas, uh, in Luo, the wakes in that area uh, involved the use of a sound system. So family and friends, especially elders, would come forward or would go to the center, hold the microphone, and share words of wisdom, which in sometimes involve uh, a story. So storytelling is part uh, of the discourse during a wake and even wedding celebration. The story writers narrated that they listened uh, to the stories told during these um, moments. And then when they come home, they would convert these stories into big books. Other sources of stories were uh, told by elders, uh, from folklore, told by their hey, students, and their the, 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 observation of what was happening around the community. So I, I wrote in my study that uh, the teachers virtually became ethnographers. They were recording, they were uh, researching, uh, you know, the materials that they could use for their big books. Uh, these were the contextualization themes that emerged in my study. Um, to have a complete grasp of the story, uh, one uh, has to read the text, examine the pictures, and listen to the oral explanations. You know? It's not enough to just read the big books. You have to be there and listen to the teachers. The stories uh, that were presented uh, through the big books give insight about the life in Bugyas. They mention people, the names of people, uh, the roles that they play, like the, the prominent ones are the grandparents, um, the places, uh, events, animals, plants, food. There's a constant reference to practices and values related to vegetable farming, which is the main livelihood in the area. Bugyas is known as the vegetable basket of the Philippines. There are many stories about the grandfather and grandmother who are busy at the vegetable garden, even when they're already old. And uh, their task is also to instruct uh, their grandchildren how to take care of the animals, how to take care of the plants, what to do when certain problems happen. They are seen to be active in organizing obo, uh, this um, uh, 
mutual cooperative uh, labor um, arrangement. Okay, and because what happened is like uh, the because of the fluctuating uh, prices of vegetables, uh, the farmers would constantly listen to the radio or would check the Facebook so that when it is announced that the price of a certain vegetable has gone up, they would organize uh, a labor group. They would organize their neighbors and their kaugbo so that they would work together in harvesting that kind, uh, the, the vegetable, the particular vegetable. So there are many themes about that. Um, and then there's also uh, there's like this, let me look at the pictures here, the story books here. This is the story about Lolong, uh, Lolong Keteng, okay? Um, the, and then this is the story of two boys, uh, Andoy and Amboy. They were gathering, they, uh, they are gathering peanut, which is wild berries. So they, it's, it's called Naminit. They gathered uh, wild berries, uh, maybe in the mountains. This is a story of the foundation day in Bugyas, the sports activities that happen. This is a story about a duck. We uh, find here a grandfather instructing his grandchildren how to take care of a duck, what to do if the duck uh, gets stuck. And there are stories about Badang, the helping your neighbor, uh, being there to help your neighbor when they are uh, organizing a ritual feast or if there's a wedding. And Sapata means promise. Like uh, in they, this story describes how um, contracts happen in the past because they didn't have um, written contracts then. Then they would use, uh, you know, their the, their words to give their promise that they would pay a, a certain amount if they owe something, uh, if they bought something uh, from their neighbor. Now the issue of disappearance of of the kamote or sweet kam uh, sweet potato would often come up during my stay in Bugyas. You know? um, and it's interesting that many people in, among my interlocutors would bring this up. Um, historically, kamote is the main staple uh, of people in Benguet. Uh, Henry Scott described them as root-eating people, you know, the root crop. So it's linked to their identity. It's, uh, Jenk said that it's always abundant in their homes. Um, the vine, the kamote vine, is used for animal as animal food and body covering. They are woven; uh, it's woven together, and it is used in ritual feasts. Uh, this is a community in Latinidad. Um, so, uh, in even in the stories, we find uh, in the stories how kamote is mentioned uh, in a lot of uh, situation, like in uh, the story of Rosa. It is harvested in harvested in bulk. It is used for uh, feeding babies. Uh, it is pulverized and dried uh, and eaten during typhoon season. However, my interviewers, interviewers, uh, interviewees would mention that uh, they noticed that kamote is no longer available in the gardens, uh, and it's now being sold in the market. It is being um, transported from other provinces. Um, and so, uh, because of that, you know, the practice of uh, making buko, uh, this is pulverized kamote, and uh, it, you know, uh, and it's being cooked as snacks, uh, tinopigan, is no longer uh, available because of the low supply of kamote. Uh, the local ag agriculturists in that place where I stayed uh, told me that the current soil condition in the area cannot sustain kamote anymore. Like they said that when they plant kamote and when they dig it, uh, the, the root would be rotten. It's, it will not grow like before. And they would attribute it to the use, heavy use of chemical farming in the area. And in the course of my interviews, uh, there are many reference about environmental changes and disappearance, you know, the, the theme of disappearance would often come up. For example, there's the story about uh, Lolo, this uh, grandfather and his grandson, uh, they were gathering fish uh, in Pusong, okay, in, a, in a river in Pusong, and they were using um, ube. This is a woven fish trap. It's like a basket. 
and they would bring uh, the baskets to the river and use to trap the fish. And people around me, when I asked about ube, uh, they said that ube, the ube is no longer found in the community. Uh, why? Because the river has become uh, uh, you know, dirty, so dirty that uh, fish would no longer grow in the area. And they said that uh, containers of uh, fertilizers and um, other chemicals would be thrown in the river. And so it's no longer safe for fishing and even for swimming. So the story about uh, picnicking, swimming in the river is something that was done in the past. There's also the story about Kipkibalot. Uh, Kitong is the name of a person and uh, Kipkibalot is a uh, bat. And the writer mentioned that this story uh, is about a bat uh, and it's useful in eating the mosquitoes, you know, killing the mosquitoes in the home. However, the author said that Kipkibalot, the bat is no longer found in their area because of uh, deforestation, you know, because of the, the trees are cut in the mountains, therefore there, you know, bats can no longer be found in their area. Here's an example of how uh, the disappear or the environmental change uh, brought by chemical farming is affecting uh, uh, their, their diet, uh, the animals in the place. Uh, the teacher in this particular uh, class, I think it's a grade three class, uh, told the story about the mole cricket, Kaka. And before she told the story, she gave some background. These were her exact words. She said that mole crickets live in the uh, mud, in the past during maybe when she was a child the soil was still in a better condition because uh, she said the farmers then did not use insecticide which was harmful to their health to one's health so at that time it was safe to gather mole cricket uh, and they were uh, the mole crickets were roasted and uh, they were you know they were tasty and eaten with rice and she said that because chemicals are now applied on the ground pests have increased Therefore, it is no longer safe to eat more crickets. So if you notice the reference about the soil is not uh, mentioned in the story itself, but it is um, cited. Uh, it is, uh, you know, being, it's being brought up during the uh, oral explanation of the teacher. So it's to have a full grasp of the story. You have to hear what the teachers would uh, say as they read the story or before they read the story. So in conclusion, um, we see here that the policies, the MTBMLE and the Indigenous People Education Policies have uh, provided the means to produce uh, storybooks. It addresses the perennial problem of um, lack of materials. And teachers uh, learn new, a new skill. They became bookmakers. Uh, they learn how to craft story into uh, you know something that would be suitable for a big book. They learn how to edit each other's work. Uh, they also learn how to illustrate uh, or to how to find illustrators in the community. And they learn how to use the computer to lay out the text and to print and reproduce them. I found that in some uh, schools in the area, uh, the, the if a principal is supportive to MTBMLE, uh, she would buy a large printer, which will be used in printing and reproducing the big books uh, for the school. And at the same time, uh, the storybooks are not just meant to teach uh, literacy. They, are all, it, they also attempt to create a sense of place, a sense of history, a shared identity. Um, and they provide prompts for a critical view of the place. And so uh, I'm proposing that uh, an alternative to culturally responsive education or culture-based education, maybe it is more productive to uh, introduce the practice of critical-based learning. Because sometimes the term, the notion of culture becomes so contested, especially when people imagine culture as something essentialized, bounded, you know, the culture of the Kankanai, Ibaloy. And we know that culture is something evolving. Once you essentialize culture, then you um, there's a tendency to uh, to see people, to see uh, the culture bearers as something that is uh, frozen in time. 
And so in, in lieu of a culture-based education, a critical-based learning would, be prompt, would raise questions, uh, would raise the prompts for critical thinking uh, to happen. It would raise this question uh, like the following, what are the best features of our community? What could be done to make it a better place for all? What is the quality of our local environment, the air, water, soil, native flora, and fauna? What might, be, what, what might we do to conserve our environment and resources to achieve a more sustainable future? This question were raised by McIrney. Uh, and then Greenwood, uh, an author of uh, place-based learning said, uh, you know, uh, uh, PBL should ask the question, what happened here? What happened in the past? So in the context of Bugyas, um, the big books can raise the questions like, what don't we eat kamote? Why don't we eat kamote anymore? Why don't we go to the river and swim anymore? Why don't we find ube anymore? What is a reasonable amount of hard work that does not lead to the exploitation of the environment? What are the alternative to lessen the impact of chemical farming? So these are the big book writers. Uh, I really salute them, uh, admire them for their hard work. Many of them uh, spend their own money to create the big books. And I hope that uh, DepEd will provide all the resources so that uh, a complete set of big books will be provided uh, for all school. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Arizadon, for another insightful presentation that highlights the role of play in mother tongue storybooks. So that ends the two presentations for this session. But as I mentioned earlier, there will be two abstracts to be read by Professor Arzaton. But before she does that, as you think through your questions for this session, let me just briefly provide a summary of the previous presentations before Professor Arzaton leaves the abstracts of the other two papers. Okay? So um, Mang Claire Balassin's study examined the development and utilization of 10 Kankanai storybooks to improve the reading skills of grade two pupils of Natubleng Elementary School and Nabalikong Salpin Elementary School within the school year 2018 to 2019. The second presentation by Professor Arzadon conducted an ethnographic study to describe the making of storybooks in, in Bukyas. Uh, the researcher conducted participant observation and examined some 53 teacher made storybooks or mother tongue storybooks which are primarily used to develop literacy skills. There are, however, two more abstracts for which, unfortunately, the authors have not been able to submit the presentations. And Professor um, Arzadon was gracious enough to offer to read their abstracts or to read the abstracts of the two other presentations which are part of this organized panel. Professor Arzadon is also the corresponding author, so she will answer your questions about her presentation and the answer. Go ahead, Nani. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Um, so I'm glad that the presenters, the writers of these papers are here with, with me. So this is the title of Mam Tapdi's uh, presentation. Mam Tapdi is the school head, uh, the teacher in charge of Bad Ayan and Integrated School in Bugyas. Uh, addressing school dropout in Cordillera through alternative learning delivery modes. Uh, Philippine Statistics Authority has reported that out of a total high school age youth in the Cordillera region, only 79.77% are enrolled in high school and only 70% graduate on time. While the Cordillera region tops the literacy rate, it is lower in these indicators indicators compared to its northern Luzon neighbors. To improve school access and participation, the Department of Education has introduced alternative learning delivery modes. These are non-conventional strategies that use flexible modalities and schedules. Examples of this program are alternative learning system, open high school system, and home study program. This paper examined the alternative delivery modes applied by teachers of Bugyas Benguet. Its objective was to identify the measures that were undertaken to keep improving learning outcomes. The study found that the alternative learning system has organized social activities like the search for Mr. and Mrs. Als and other forms of entertainment. The program also conducted free skills and livelihood training that led to national certification level two. It must be noted that ALS learners are mostly adults. 
On the other hand, the intervention for younger learners identified uh, as sardo or student at risk of dropping out involved the following remedial classes, counseling, and home visitation. One school introduced the flexi time option for its 40 sardos, which can either be in school remedial instruction or independent home study. The teachers also introduced loop, a word activity, crossword puzzles, game cards, and other educational games. The whole program lasted for three months. The study found that academic performance of Sardos improved by 80% and only, drop, and only two dropped out of school. It was also found that alternative learning delivery modes require highly dedicated and multi-skilled teachers. It is recommended that every school should explore its own alternative delivery modes that are sensitive to its social and economic context. Thank you. So if you have questions uh, for the paper, Mam Tapdi is here to answer them. Then uh, last but not the least uh, paper is uh, what to do with non-readers in high school. The authors are uh, Mam Herminia Usting. Uh, she's the principal of uh, Tishi and the uh, former PSDS of DepEd Division uh, of Benguet. And Sir George Apiet of Tishi or Tublay uh, High School. The Philippine Institute of Development Studies, PIDS, has recently found in their study that underachieving students in elementary grades, some of whom are non-readers, are being promoted to high school. This phenomenon has led policymakers and education leaders to prove the issue. Meanwhile, high schools all over the country have to provide interventions when they find non-readers among their enrollees. One such high school or one such school is Tublay School of Home Industries at Tublay Benguet. Next, please. This paper describes the experiences of Tishi in identifying and assessing the learning needs of the non readers among the grade seven entrants. It discussed the challenges in providing intervention, like the lack of read training of high school teachers to teach remedial reading lack of materials, and the strong sense of shame and embarrassment demonstrated by high school age non-readers. The intervention program that was introduced by Tishi involved the use of uh, the mother tongue, Filipino, and English literacy materials, interactive and fun learning activities, one-on-one -on -one peer tutorial session provided by senior high school students who were doing their practicum, and the giving of tangible and intangible incentives for every small step achievement. The reading tutors were selected based on their record of positive behavior, area of specialization, such as humanities and school sciences track, and express aspiration to be a teacher or social worker. The, uh, the reading tutor as assignment was integrated in the required 80 hour work immersion of the senior high school curriculum. Considerable improvement in reading skills was observed at the end of the remediation period. The reading tutors also reported that the experience proved to be rewarding and fulfilling as they were given the opportunities to use their talent in designing materials and educational activities. So if you have a question for Mam Ma Usting, she is around. And for your information, Mam Ma Usting is the main trainer and champion of MTBMLE in uh, uh, Benguet Division. She authored more than 100 storybooks. So if you have any question, then we are ready to answer them. Thank you, Professor Zadon, for reading the abstracts. And those are the two presentations and two abstracts for the session. And we are glad uh, that we have the presence or joining us are the most, if not all, of the authors for these papers. So if you have questions, as Professor Arzadon has stated, you may ask them directly. So um, we have a fairly good amount of time for the question and answer portion. We have 25 minutes as the session is supposed to end at 12 o'clock. So um, I've seen a couple or three questions in the chat box, so let's get right to it. Um, if you want to answer the questions, you may, of course, uh, show yourself or um, um, turn on the video and unmute yourselves for our presenters. Okay, uh, let's start with a question from Mr. Ronald Dulay. How much budget is allot allotted to create one storybook? 
starting from the field research to the printing of the material. Um, I guess this question is for Professor Chet, but for other presenters as well, if you want to answer, just yeah. very much. Ma'am Usting probably uh, will be the best person to answer this question. Ma'am Usting, can you turn on your mic and answer the question? Um, that depends on the... Uh... Thank you, ma'am, for giving the opportunity. <laughs> that depends on the uh, the uh, paper, ma'am, and the illustrator. If they will be paying the illustrator, uh, they will be using the high class paper. Of course, it is uh, expensive. It's expensive. However, if they will be using the band paper, then and they will be the, become their illustrator. Then, of course, cheaper, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in they have uh, isang suke, no? they have one suke illustrator and right now she charges 100 pesos only for one illustration so so yeah and then they uh, have them printed in a uh, print shop sa abatan <laughs> sa ano lang, estimation ano, uh, among teachers they said that they would spend total of 3,000 pesos for one big book because they have to pay the pamasahe, the transportation of the illustrator as he would go to uh, Luo or to their area. They have to print the materials and then it will go through uh, revision, review. So at, uh, and then they will have it bound. Uh, mayroon silang binding ano? and then reproduce. So sabi nila mga roughly ganon. Pero sabi ni Ma'am Usting, pwede rin mura lang. Ano? Depende sa materials. Or some uh, big bookmakers ask their children to be the illustrators. So talagang uh, wala silang gasto sa illustration. So that's how much they spend. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, related to the question of access, so there is a comment here from uh, Shirley Gumpad that we just read it. Um, good morning. Thank you very much for presenting your MTV MLE big book. Can we have a copy of your book so that we can use it as our sample or guide in making our own? Uh, uh, they are all up. I mean, uh, the ones that are edited uh, are uploaded in LRMDS. Okay. Uh, and they're also, you can also find them in the CAR region uh, website. So they have a link there. Uh, so. Or you can, I, I, I have some collection, but the ones that are edited and talagang maganda yung coloring niya, na hen siya, are all uploaded in the LRMDS. And for your information, uh, DepEd you know, has supported 19 languages initially, but the most number of big books come from Benguet. You know, talagang phenomenal ang contribution ng Benguet sa mother tongue storybook. So, just go, just log in in LRMDS, sir. All right, thank you. Now we have a question from YouTube, okay, forwarded by our CSC director, Mamrud. Uh, to Mom Arzadon, in the Bugyas context, what do you think are the factors present that enable the teachers to produce their learning materials? Okay, uh, Mom Usting, <laughs> can you uh, share from, uh, I'll ask Mom Usting first and I'll also add my idea. Mamusting, from your own uh, experience, what do you think are the factors that contributed? Uh, Ma'am, number one is commitment of teachers and school heads. The collaboration of the school is also a great factor. And of course, cooperation, ma'am, of each uh, teachers and school head. Um, the cooperation of the school head and the uh, teachers are very much needed. Because even if they are not grade one teachers, if they are interested, then of course books will multiply, multiply, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the, the first set of big books uh, emanated from Bangao, where ma'am Usting uh, became the principal. So what she did, uh, because DepEd provided a curriculum for mother tongue for the whole year. So what she did, she organized the teacher. From all grades, you know, she asked the she asked for volunteers to make the big books, and so they produce a big book for every sound, you know, because uh, you have to teach a uh, you know like A or M or S, you have to teach each sound with a story and with a big book. So in 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 my experience, I found that the principal is a key actor 
is uh you know she can make it happen so once the principal is not supported it will be very difficult there are situations that the principal is not supportive but the teacher is committed so they have to um they have to uh force <laughs> the principal they have to motivate the principal so convince her to uh, to help another um enabling factor is the presence of um yung technology sabi nga ni ma'am usting na grow yung technology along with the policy so maybe when the xerox uh, shops uh, notice that there's a demand for printing uh of a3 papers colored papers so they set up a ano, machines ano uh, machine for that and they also provided the technical help uh, another thing is yung situatedness because as i mentioned in my paper Talagang yung storytelling is a, a habit, you know, it's a cultural practice in the area. They, ha they have so many stories. Uh, unfortunately, some teachers do not have the resources because DepEd does not support them. You know? What DepEd does is to give points for promotion so that uh, if you earn enough, then you'll be promoted. But in, uh, in terms of, you know, money, they can use their MOOE, pero not fully. And so uh, one enabling factor is the presence of the story. Um, disabling is yung finances. Another enabling uh, factor is the mentorship. They mentor each other. Uh, Ma'am Usting and their CID chief, Ma'am uh, Rislin, provided countless training you know, uh, to the teachers in making a big book. So some of the big books that are collected were, from, were output of the training. The mayor of Bugas is also supportive. Um, what else? So I think uh, it's the leadership uh, and the culture and the infrastructure and the organization. Uh, those are factors. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for raising these issues. The enabling conditions, para masabi namin, mga success stories and mga storybooks. I think uh, this is a very enlightening discussion. Now, um, there's a question from Eric Joyce Grande on. Um, probably um, may we know the status or state of MPB MLE in the context of the recent ed communication. I mean, anyone who wants to probably share information or has an answer to this question? Mm, yeah, I, I, I watched the recording of the EDCOM meeting. Ang maganda lang dito sa EDCOM meeting, uh, one of the leaders is PBED, you know, uh, Philippine Business for Education, and they are the ones who influence the former administration to include MTBMLE in the uh, ano yun, agenda of uh, President Aquino. Kaya naging part ng MTBMLE sa K-12 law. And so uh, based on the PBED presentation in EDCOM, they want MTBMLE to be con uh, continued uh, they say that it's based on research. Ang problema lang ay implementation. Ano? So right now, ang uh, central office, the Bureau of Learning Delivery, is developing uh, operations manual for MTBMLE. Actually, yung DEPED Order uh, 21, Series 2019, has 27 pages uh, of guidelines for MTBMLE. Kailangan lang talaga ma-implement siya. Ano? Again, the principle is the key here. So if you are an advocate or you know a teacher educator, you have to reach out to the principal because uh, they you know they are the key. So yun po. I think. Um, but of course, ang EDCOM also is participated by the Congress, and we are aware that in the Congress, uh, Congressman, um, the Congressman of Baguio submitted uh, a bill to abrogate MTBMLE. Mark Go, no. So we'll see, you know. Uh, so that's why we want support from um, the speakers of the of mother tongue, educators, advocates to uh, make sure that MTBMLE stays and it will be implemented well. Otherwise, like what happened to vernacular education, it lasted from 1957 to 1973. Nawala siya, no? So I hope that uh, it will stay as a result of EDCOM. Okay, we have 15 minutes remaining for the question and answer. Um, I see one more question in the chat box and one more comment. So we have the time for them, but if you have questions and you want to ask the questions live or verbally, you may also raise your hand and of course turn on your video. Okay, um, let's get right, uh, right to it. Um, we have another question from Julius Cesar Makuti and his question is, 
Do you also pay royalty to the original storyteller or at least to the tribe where it belongs? Ma'am Usting, can you, uh, no, or Ma'am uh, Tapdi, if you have any, since you are the heads, the supervisor and principal. Uh, Ma'am, for royalty people, uh, I did not receive any. However, uh, it's a part of my job. That's why I do not expect that I will, I am, I will be receiving a royalty fee. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, ma'am Tapdi, do uh, you have something to say since you're also from the community? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it could be if we are going to publish it in the publishing company in the future, there could be a royalty, but as of now, there is none. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yun ang isang issue sa DepEd, ano, yung copyright. Um, but the thing is, the writers themselves, uh, they are they are part of the IP group. Ano? Kasi ang question yata is if it's coming from the community. So the they are part of the IP community. They are also teachers and then they are the authors. Uh, in fairness naman, sa DepEd, meron naman dong copyright notice ano, that they're not... Output should not be sold, um, so it, it will be used only for ano, no, for instruction. Ganyan. So hindi pa siya ano. Kaya I'm encouraging the local publishers because we have so many because of MTBMLE we have they have trained so many writers. So if if uh, the local publishers can publish uh, their original output ano, kahit yung wala, kasi wala maraming pang stories na wala sa DepEd, no. Uh, there are they have so many stories that are waiting to be printed. So, kailangan ma, ma convince ang mga local publishers because what's happening is, uh, you know, uh, ko konti lang talaga ang recognize ng local publishing. Lalo na sa Central, I mean sa Manila, you know, like Adarna. So we have to recognize our local writers. We have to, you know, recognize their effort and provide avenues uh, where they can express and be rewarded compensated for their work. Okay, since we still have time, pwede pa po tayong magtanong kung meron pa tayong mga gustong i-clarify sa ating mga authors. Now, we have time to engage this comment from Shirley Gumpad. Um, My concern about the use of MPB MLE is that based from observations, learners have a hard time to adjust when they already reach grade four using non-MTB MLE language or languages. Transition from MTB MLE to English or Tagalog languages. Do you have like, anything you want to say about this? Probably just some thoughts you want to share. <laughs> um, Ma'am Usting. <laughs> Ma'am Usting, do you have something to say about this question? Uh, Ma'am, I think uh, since uh, the bridging will start in grade four, of course, uh, it's really a bit hard for the teachers in grade four to be bridging the uh, mother tongue to other languages like um, the mother tongue to English or mother tongue to Filipino. However, if the teachers of the grade four will be, uh, will be doing it daily, if they will be going to grade five, then there will be no it is not too hard because the teachers of grade one, uh, grade one teachers will teach the learners how to read and the teachers in grade two will be enhancing reading and comprehension skills in the mother tongue. And of course, there is, there is their, I mean, the other languages like English and Filipino subject in grade two and in grade three. So the grade two and grade three teachers started the bridging already, which we continue it's to be continued by the grade four teachers, sana. But based also on observation, the higher grade teachers are also using the mother tongue language in every subject that they are, in other subjects that they are teaching. That's why uh, I think that's the gap. That's the problem for in the learners are being hard up in going to other languages Yes, when we will be going to higher grades, ma'am. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um, we admit, because I'm also one of those who 
train the teachers in 2010, ano, yung national training noon, na ang strength ng MTBML originally is literacy and L1, ano, how to be, read and write. Okay, ang isang weakness niya is bridging from L1 to L2. Ano? Um, and so, ito yung mag introduce ng operations manual. We are developing an operations manual so that uh, teachers will know how to bridge from L1 to L2. Ano? Um, and also training. Ang na-train lang kasi sa MTBMLE in 2012, ay majority ay grade 1 teachers. Uh, very minimal ang training ng ibang teachers. Ano? Depende na lang sa division like Ma'am Usting is very active in training uh, the teachers. No? Uh, so hopefully, um, I hope, uh, and also we're calling yung mga uh, HEI, TEI, to provide training uh, on bridging L1 to L2 because we already have the theory. Uh, we have uh, bilingual education uh, principles, practices. We have translanguaging, you know, and there are other models of bridging L1 to L2, dual language program. Uh, so, ginagawa na to sa ibang bansa. We just need to train our teachers and provide models. So, uh, so yun po ang ating ano, uh, let's make DepEd make sure that uh, let's make sure that DepEd will train their teachers and provide the resources for bridging L1 to L2 beginning from grade 4 onwards. But at the same time, dapat ang tingin din sa mother tongue ay hindi lang siya transitional na bridge to L2. We need to maintain ano, our languages, uh, you know, our, uh, our culture, our languages beyond grade 3. You know? So dapat uh, you know, some countries, they maintain, like when you're Korean, Japanese, Chinese, they maintain their language hanggang university level. So dapat, uh, we should also assess how we view our mother tongues. Are they just bridges, you know? Uh, are they just, you know, uh, being used, are they just used as means to learn L2? Uh, parang sikat ka lang if you're able to prove, yun yung problema sa PISA teams, ano? Parang you have to prove your knowledge in, in English. Kasi yung mga teams, yung sinasabi ng World Bank ngayon, yung team CPLM, those are assessment, our children were assessed in English. You know? And they were not allowed to show what they know in our local language. Kahit man lang sa Filipino, there's no uh, space for that. You know? So uh, we need to really recognize that our languages are avenues where our children can uh, display what they know. You know? The, what they know in math, science, social studies, and other content areas. Okay, thank you. I believe we still have time for this question from YouTube. Uh, so very interactive in session happened. Now, uh, the question is uh, to the panelists, how do you ensure quality assurance on the learning materials that we don't produce in Ah, okay. I hope, um, I wish Ma'am Claire is here, know. but see Ma'am, Hosting is part of the QA team. They have a QA team, district school level, district level, and division. So, Ma'am Hosting, uh, and I think even Ma'am Australia uh, can talk about the QA process in Benguet. Hello, Ma'am. Yes, Ma'am. Uh, yes. We are, I mean, I mean uh, QR started in the classroom. We're in our first. Uh, uh, First, uh, um, are the learners. If they are reading the story, then you, as a teacher, as you listen, you will also you will all uh, you will notice the the difference or I mean the error in your book. And then the second one are the teachers. We are giving the uh, uh, our books to the teachers. They will be uh, reading it and then. Of course, they will be giving some suggestions. And of course, the community also. And after that, we have our district uh, QR and then we have our division, ma'am. So, uh, doon na tumataas ang presyo ng big box, ma'am. <laughs> Kasi napapalitan, uh, of course, kailangan ang finance, ma'am. So, yeah. Uh, oh, totally, uh, the prices of big books are cheap. However, if it will be, um, if the, uh, if QR process will start, then doon na po tayo mag-aano uh, sa mga uh, finance. 
Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Ang isa rin na, ang, ang interesting, iba-iba yung practices nila. No? Kasi DepEd issued, uh, especially uh, Benguet Division, uh, they issued a system for QA, quality assurance. Ang ginagawa ng isang teacher, nakita ko ano, sa Luo uh, Elementary School, uh, pinapabasa niya muna sa mga students niya, no? nakalagay sa Manila paper or ano yun, yung, uh, yung kartulina, yung story. Because these children, they went through mother tongue mula kindergarten, grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. Mas maalam na sila no? by grade 3. They are more familiar with the spelling, how the word is used. And sometimes they're even better uh, than their teacher. Ano? Because the teacher, you know, uh, ang alam lang niya is the spoken kankana, eh, the written kankana is different. Ano? It's their first time to, to learn it. So I found this teacher, what she did, ipapabasa niya muna sa mga students niya and then the students can give their feedback ano, about how words uh, should be spelled or what words to be used. And then what they do in the school, uh, they print the story, uh, nakikita ko to eh, in, pinapaikot sa mga teachers. So during break time, they would, the teachers would uh, edit, they would edit each other's work, you know, the work of that uh, particular writer. And then uh, ko, when I attend ito mga sports meet, the principal would gather from various schools, you know, the principal would gather together sa classroom, sa isang hall. And I find them carrying the big book of their teacher ini edit din ng principal ano ini -re review rin nila so level ng language spelling use ano and then uh, mayroong QA team ang district and then may QA team ang division ano so talagang kaya sabi ni Ma'am Usting talagang dumaan talaga sa maraming gastos kasi kung mayroong babaguhin uh, i you know ire -re ano ulit pati pati nga picture eh for example, yung picture ng isang bata na nagbubuhat ng kamote na mabigat. Okay. Sabi nila, ay hindi yan appropriate kasi masyado pa siyang bata. So pinabago yung picture, pinalaki siya, no? Para to communicate na the, the, they are not supporting child labor. So they are, uh, you know, uh, they are editing the, the text, uh, in the, the accuracy of the text, appropriateness of words, and even the, the pictures. You know? So... Talagang amazing yung ano nila, yung effort nila to produce a big book. But at the same time, uh, I, I didn't mention uh, in my talk na for the bank division to give points, uh, credit points a teacher, each teacher should produce at first 25 big books. Dapat makompleto mo. Later on, binawasan nila naging 20. Ngayon, 10 na lang. Ano? So if you're able to produce 10 books, then they will give you some credit points. If not... Uh, manalo ka na lang sa mga competition. May competition din naman, ano? may yearly competition. Uh, unfortunately, ang competition lang ng Kankana ay hanggang division level. I don't know if, um, until this uh, region. But for national, ang nire-recognize lang ay Filipino and English uh, big books. So yan, Thank sir. you, Ma'am Mustin, uh, Ma'am Claire, and Ma'am Pat D for all your answers to the questions and for effectively managing the time.